So, hi everyone, I'm Sebastian Reynolds. Welcome to my podcast. Uh, very excited to be here, Wednesday the 9th of June 2021. And in fact, this is the first one we're recording in person. So up until now, we've been sort of doing them remotely over Zoom or Skype or whatever. And um, so yeah, here I am at Safe House Studios in Oxford. Um, recording and producing for us is Mike, Mike Bannard. He's a good friend of mine, and he actually produces and mixes my music for me. So it's nice to be working with him. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thanks. I'll uh, say hello. Normally, I'm just hidden behind the window, but I'm I'm here in real life as well. Yeah, and we're going to be calling on Mike's uh, help if needs be, if we need him to fact check anything, because I am prone to elaborate and exaggerate things for effect. So. We might need some Google skills. And uh, yeah, and today I'm having a chat with my good friend Hugo Shakeshaft. So me and Hugo have got to know each other through sort of various Buddhist circles. Uh, we both teach Buddhist meditation and practice Buddhist meditation in a style from Thailand, uh, Thai style. And yeah, so Hugo, I don't know if you... Well, actually, first I'll just say, so what we're talking about today is... The show that I helped to kind of, well, I developed and worked with Dr. Sarah Shaw actually from Oxford University and Neon Dance Company and Pichet Clinchen from Thailand. It's the Mahajanaka dance drama, which is, it tells the story of Mahajanaka Jataka. The Jatakas were this set of stories from ancient India, very, very ancient stories, some of the oldest surviving stories from Indian mythology. And they tell, it's a very large canon and these different stories represent different elements uh, of things that the Buddha was developing in his previous lives on his way to, to full enlightenment in his last life. And Hugo is a classicist uh, specialising in Greek studies at Oxford University. Hugo, do you want to talk a bit about your professional expertise first? Uh, yeah, so I, I specialise in ancient Greece uh, of the archaic and classical period. Uh, and I look at the literature, the art, the archaeology, the history. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's the kind of period that when we have uh, Homer, so some of our earliest Greek literature comes out. Um, and in particular, I work on uh, aesthetics and Greek religion. Um, where there's a lot of crossover actually with some of the stories that we find in the Jatakas and indeed the one that we'll talk about today. Cool. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I think going back a few years, I came across the Jatakas thanks to Sarah Shaw and her wonderful set of translations for Penguin Classics, the Jatakas, Birth Stories of the Bodhisattva. And I was trying to recollect what really drew me to the story. I mean, being a musician and a sort of sound maker and composer and so on, there's music and sound does play a sort of interesting symbolic role in in the story. And But I think there's sort of deeper things that really drew me to it and this thing about sort of rite of passage and in the way that we depicted the story, we had just the two dancers for the whole show, so a male and female dance, male and female dancers and... Um, one of each, and Pichet, the Thai dancer. So we work with Pichet Clunchen, the Thai dance artist, and then a dancer from Adrienne's company, firstly Tilly, and then Kamala Devam uh, stepped into the role for the second set of performances. And we decided to have the female performer performing the three different female character roles. So we sort of reduced it down. There are other sort of smaller sort of bit characters and so on, but we wanted to really emphasise this relationship between the masculine and the feminine in the narrative. And so having Pichette playing the Bodhisattva in the three sort of stages of manhood, of development, and then firstly Tilly and then Kamala performing firstly as the mother so the story starts with the pregnant mother now this discussion is going to be predicated on the assumption that you know the story and that you may hopefully will have seen the performance already so we'll try and keep you up to date we'll try and give you a sense of the narrative as we're going along but if you haven't if you're listening to this and you haven't managed to actually catch the performance or read the story before i'd encourage you to sort of look out sarah's book or the full performance videos on my youtube channel and have a look at that and sarah actually also gives an introduction to the story as well so it's it's probably best to sort of stop here 
if you haven't already if you don't already know the story if you haven't seen the performance and check it out and then come back so you might get a bit lost but also i do see this story as being a really interesting window into well what i perceive as this sort of notions of buddhism and 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 some interesting ideas i think which relate to how different communities of people are relating to different aspects of buddhism buddhist theology and culture as well as practice in in the west and in the east but yeah just to, just to put in that little disclaimer sorry if you uh, very quickly have no idea what we're talking about but um yeah the uh, the the performance is up there so check it out so anyway the story begins with an intrigue between two brothers and then the the wife of one of them so one of the brother kills the other and then the wife of that brother who's killed has to flee and she disguises herself and she's pregnant as well with the great being with the bodhisattva and she manages to escape and she makes it to the next city and and there's an interesting parallel i feel with with that first sort of opening gambit and then the, so this story is one of the most popular and sort of venerated stories in thailand and in southeast asia particularly for the sea swim scene and it was actually king boomable the now deceased king of thailand's favorite jataka story and it's incredibly famous like apparently people in thailand generally refer to it as like they'll refer to it in terms of the sea swimming like that's and it's this idea of the bodhisattva developing this quality of virya the buddhist quality of virya and i feel like sarah and i'm i'm not criticizing or judging or anything like everyone has their own you know rights to their ways of interpreting these concepts and ideas and words and so on and it's very very difficult and very very complicated but personally i i my view on, on the idea of virya the notion of virya within a spiritual context whether it's buddhism or whatever it might be is that it's about courage um and um and courageous effort like effort is part of it but there's something about facing your demons facing your worst fears and i mean it would be interesting to get a bit into the idea of virya and the, the roots of it do you have something to say about the roots like the meaning of the um, concept yeah well so i mean the word is uh, has some common uh, roots with a set of words that we find um in uh, in in latin um so sanskrit and pali and latin all belong to a group of what are called indo-european languages so they have some common common semantic roots um and in in latin the words that are clearly related to virya are vir or weir which means man and virtus which means sort of manliness or excellence um so there's a clear kind of family of words across different cultures which have some notion of of courage strength whatever one a label you want to put on it yeah mm. yeah and th- th- there are like i suppose as we've talked about before different uh buddhist communities place different kinds of emphasis on different elements of developing practice and developing towards whatever we conceive of as enlightenment but so in this story in particular we see these courageous acts these acts of courage where people where whether it's the mahajanaka himself or or the pregnant mother where they're in genuine state of peril and uh, it just really interests me. So there's these qualities. So virya, courage, is one of the seven well-known factors of enlightenment. So the seven sort of fundaments of developing oneself to become enlightened. Um, and the seven are, so sati, mindfulness, which is a very sort of popular and sort of fashionable term in Buddhism, especially thanks to the sort of ubiquitous nature of, of meditation and apps and so on people really starting to get this idea of, of mindfulness and mindful presence and so on it's become a bit of a like yeah that's another that's a whole other road where we maybe go down later but yeah mindfulness and then dhamma vichaya and that's sort of often taken as investigation and i think in, in a, often the sort of communities that are looking at this stuff are, are very much thinking in a sort of academic way about 
you know, investigation in the sense of sort of reading books and learning and so on. And I, I sort of feel like that's an element of it. But as we see in these stories and, and other stories related to the Buddha, that I think there's a much more down to earth, like worldly element to Dhammavachaya in terms of just like resourcefulness, like getting yourself together. Like we'll talk in a moment about the sea swim specifically and how I feel that that quality is represented in that context. And and then very as we talked about courage and then PT, this sort of joy uh, or energization. But I feel, I feel like, again, that quality is sort of slightly misapprehended because in the in sense of purifying i think it's joy in the sense of a catharsis and then after that comes the calming like pasadi and then a sort of even-minded well no firstly samadhi like concentration like being able to sort of bring the mind to complete focus and then upeka a sort of even-mindedness having been through that process and yeah, I feel like in the sea swim we see some of these elements at play, and in the the uh, uh, like the what happens with the mother, the pregnant mother, both of them uh, respond to a genuine peril. They're aware. There's a sort of mindfulness, and then there's this sense of gathering and taking what's to hand and making the most of what they can, what what's what they can do. Do you want to read that section, mm-hmm. and then that gives I mean, way? Another to the way I sort of see it how it relates to to Dhamma Vichaya there is and this this in a sense evokes that quality of investigation is seeing what you need mm. in situations that require it so first of all you become aware of a situation and then it requires some reflection or investigation to see what you need and I suppose that's in another way of saying how we need resourcefulness mm. getting yourself into the best possible state I think given the circumstances and so there's this wonderful passage um, when uh, the great being, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to become is is at sea. Um, and then there's this uh, this storm and all the other people uh, on the boat start sitting down and start praying to the gods to try and save them. Uh, and then I'll just quote this bit. It says, the great being, however, did not moan or cry or pray to deities. But seeing that the boat was about to sink, he beat together some ghee with sugar ate a bellyful and then smeared two outer garments with sesame oil, tied them on tightly and stood leaning against the mast. When the boat did sink, the mast stayed upright. So in that way, he sort of saves himself. While everyone else is praying to praying to deities and trying to find salvation outside of themselves, he does what he has to do in that moment, kind of resourceful, resourceful basic things. He needs some food, so he eats some ghee and some sugar and ties himself to a mast knowing that that's how he has the best opportunity to, to survive in a perilous situation. Interestingly, actually, the link with, uh, with Greek literature, this is what Odysseus does for a very different reason when he's at sea. Uh, he ties himself to a mast. He does it so he can listen to the sirens' beautiful song and then not, not be lured to his death by them. But there's a similar point there of not being lured to your death. Um, so again, a kind of resourcefulness. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and also the fact that he... He doesn't despair, but he's not naive either. And that that thing where he knows which way he wants to swim, he know like he works out where he wants to go to. And I, like I, I said to you earlier, there's a really interesting sort of irony in a way that, like, as you say, it's very clear that the all the people are about to drown and die and so on, they're all praying to gods and so on. And Mahajanika doesn't pray to gods, but then. It, he 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 gets his life together like he gets everything in order in the most mundane like down to earth way and he's the one who gets saved by a god by a, by goddess. a goddess yeah and the same with uh, his mother when she's pregnant with him it's just like the sort of irony that if you lean too much on like unseen forces and like rites and rituals then you're doomed but actually if you just and it says something about it says something to me about what's known in buddhism as in terms of the eightfold path in the sense that like if you just get your life in order like if your life isn't too stressful and too demanding but you you honor your duties and you're in a good state physically and mentally you know you're at the peak of your game in in, in a realistic way then actually like what could you know we'll have a sort of sense of 
divinity in a way. Like there, there will be, but you've got to play the life games by its rules. Mm. Like you can't try and jump a level. Mm. Mm. I find that really interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's the, the way I see it. There is is that you know while the others pray to gods and and well, what happens to them is they well certainly in all the images you see in Thai art and Sri Lankan art is that they get eaten by sea monsters. Um, Mahajanaka saves himself by calling on his resourcefulness, but then, as you said, Seb, it's, he's he's the one ultimately actually who's saved by a goddess. There's something interesting in that, in that you need to you need to call upon your own resourcefulness in order to then be helped by certain higher powers. It's not saying that the higher powers can't help you; indeed, they can. They ultimately, the goddess is who saves him. But the point is, you need to kind of help yourself first. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, sorry, final point. That's what happens to Odysseus as well. He he does a great swim uh, and he is saved by a goddess. So yeah, he I've, helps himself first by building a raft and then he's saved by a goddess. So a kind of similar pattern. Yeah, and also I I sort of draw a slight parallel with Noah as well from the Bible and the idea of Noah's Ark and, like again, sort of preparing for a flood, a cataclysmic flood by very much getting your house in order and being prepared in a very like down to earth way. And, and, you know, this sort of idea that we, you know, it's an existential reality to, to our lives as much now as it was then the fact that we live permanently on the precipice of catastrophe and that like, you know, something dreadful can and will happen to us quite possibly out of the blue and that you need to, if you are, you know, in the position where you've actually got your house in order in a very pragmatic, very down-to-earth, very resourceful way, then you can weather the storm much better. Uh, Yeah, and I feel like, you know, this development of Virio is also a path that the Buddha follows. And it's, it's sort of a bit of a... It's an interesting point in terms of Western sort of Buddhist apprehension or or like the, the sort of Western academic apprehension of Buddhism. And there's this period before the Buddha becomes finally enlightened. So after he's left the palace and he, he sort of has, he's born into comfort as the son of a great tribal ruler. He's shielded from the sufferings of the world because his father is told this boy will either one day become a great, spiritual leader or he'll be a great leader like a great sort of warrior king and the father wants him to be the warrior king doesn't want him to be a sort of spiritual guru so she tries to shield him from the sufferings of the world so he doesn't start to ask too many questions and then he has these experiences where he perceives death and suffering and old age and so on and then he comes to this realization that he wants to find the way out of suffering so he leaves his family he leaves the palace and he goes on all these different practices like he practices meditation states including the formless states i believe and then he sort of as i understand it he he said to have said well he realizes that they're not enough in themselves and then he goes into these very harsh ascetic practices involving very extreme fasting ultimately one grain of rice a day and he comes right to the point of death and he has this revelation that actually no this isn't the way to enlightenment and that he comes out of it now I take exception to the idea that a very commonly sort of held notion that what one should take from that is that it's sort of an injunction against aesthetic practices and pushing the body to its extreme and contemplating one's own death and so on. It's sort of like, well, he made a mistake, so we don't have to. And I sort of, I kind of feel like well, yeah, but he had to go through that. You know, he he, content, he he goes right to the point of dying. He basically overcomes, as far as I interpret it, he it seems to me that he sort of confronts his mortality directly, having seen it in others. He sees it in himself. And then it's only from there, having developed that virya, that courage, that he's able to go on and then become and, and go back into meditation. And so I feel like there's a move within a lot of, Buddhist communities to sort of try and jump that step in a way that like and and, if, and from a, a contemporary point of view it, it interests me that there's lots of these so there's obviously all these different mindfulness groups and meditation groups and Buddhist organizations and so on like in the west and all over the world and then there's all these other interesting sort of cults popping up around that I think actually uh, uh, related to this process of developing the Dhamma Vichaya and Virya, like developing 
resourcefulness, understanding the body and bringing the body into a state in the mind where it's in a state that's actually ready for the deeper states of meditation, which are only accessible once you've developed this virya. And it, it interests me, like there's a lot of people taking an interest in fasting and intermittent fasting and doing longer fasting. And, and it's been shown, there's lots of clinical data now about how powerful an intervention it is, like various forms of fasting. And also like we've talked about a lot, cold water, and these sorts of quite basic, in a way, practices, but they're tremendously powerful physically, like proven clinical data of them being very beneficial physically, but also mentally and, and spiritually as well. And I think that actually, if you look at the, the way that Buddhism has been practiced over, over the millennia, there is a lot of these sort of forms of um stoic one could say we can talk a bit about stoicism and the stoic practices that are related to what the buddha put himself through and you know even once he's enlightened you know he was a homeless man in ancient india living outside he only ate one meal a day <laughs> he walked everywhere and he lived to be 80 and you see the the 32 marks sort of description of how he appeared he had amazing glowing skin beautiful eyes like he was in great health despite that and and it's it's sort of you can imagine like we just said imagine walking down the street somewhere and seeing someone who's in rags who's obviously homeless but they're just glowing with health and well-being it's how startling that would be um and and you know there's a big connection drawn between health and well-being and the development of the enlightenment factors they're, they're completely intertwined conceptually in, in in the way that they're taught and the way they've been brought over from asia but um so i just went on a big ramble basically <laughs> i want to ask about the way that you view the kind of the the asceticism well the ascetic practices that the buddha tried out before rejecting them because if it's if, as you're saying, it's a kind of paradigm in some way, or it's it's suggesting that you kind of have to find that limit of asceticism for yourself, then by the same rationale, doesn't it mean you have to find the limit in the other direction? Because, I mean, the point with the Buddha's ascetic practices is that they are the extreme opposite to what he experienced in his life in the palace, right, where he had every sensory indulgence that you could ever want. And he saw that they didn't lead to enlightenment either, so he rejects them. And then he goes to the other extreme, and he nearly kills himself through asceticism. So if if the Buddha's life story before he becomes a Buddha is a paradigm, does that mean we should also kind of push the hedonistic extremes as well? Or, or is it just that the ascetic side has value? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I suppose it's all about context, like we, we were talking about just now, where in ancient India, you know, there were all these, the cults were just wild, like all the fire cults and these cults that were like basically starving themselves. And, you know, to, even even for the most wealthy, times were relatively tough compared to what we have now. Like, it is all relative, but the vast majority of people that have, frankly, have the sort of luxury to explore buddhism and, and mindfulness and so on are already living in a state of sort of comfort and ease which is unprecedented in our whole history as a species you know and um i was just reading i was just listening to a great interview with a, a writer called michael easter who's just written a book called the comfort crisis and it's about how our lives have just been become and I'm talking about this country, obviously, and in and, and the West, and, and there are still, like, there's places like Niger, there's places in the East, there's places in Africa and in South America that are, like, in poverty and it's carnage and hell, like, no doubt. Like, I'm speaking to people who are, you know, by the even by today's standards, like, relatively wealthy and comfortable, is that we, that, like, wealth and comfort that we have now is just been ruinous for our mental and physical health you know you think of like for the longest time starvation was a problem up until 100 years ago we were carolly 
we had um, a deficit of calories. We didn't have enough food. And suddenly we have a massive overabundance. You know, in America, 70% of people are obese. And I imagine the, the figure must be pushing in that direction here. You know, we have too much food. We have too much comfort. And it has ruinous effects on people's health and mental well-being. So, like... And yes, there are people who are anorexic. Yes, and of course there are there are, but they're in a minority considering the like the general trends. So most people's lives are just too soft and too easy compared to what we've like in 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 a, in a in, in the one way. But then they become housecapes because actually they're like because we you know we have um our, our, our sensors our sort of radar our sort of internal warning systems are, are geared towards you know hypersensitive to the things that until really recently were a genuine threat to us like cold starvation or lack of food and so on and th threat from a physical sort of um attack like from a hunter another tribe or whatever it might be and you know we we've We've sort of outgrown that, and now we live in this stultifying comfort, which makes us sort of psychologically weak and soft. And that actually, like, we need to actively work against that and to take up these practices like, like the Wim Hof thing, like cold water, cold showers, or fasting, or whatever, just to sort of because this idea of the middle way is all about context as well. And like you say, we need to, you need to understand extremity before you can find an even balance you know i don't know if that answered your question <laughs> <laughs> i mean to put it uh, to use another of the buddha's analogies which is a very beautiful one of finding the right the right note of of effort not to try too hard not to try too little is in stringing a guitar right so if you string it too tight it'll the well, the string might snap and if you string it too loose, it will produce a kind of wobbly sound and won't be in, in tune. And if you get it just right, it will. But if you watch you know, a musician tuning any instrument, they go past the point when it's right. Though. They go a bit too far and then they'll go a bit too low. Yeah. And it's by doing that that they'll find somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is a sense in which you kind of, you sort of push past the even point naturally to find where that, that even keel lies. Mm. Maybe you don't need to go to the point of, you know, eating one grain of rice. <laughs> I think it's no, important to you, be careful. You, no, no, absolutely. And 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 I suppose Dhamma Vichara is about having that holistic oversight and that mind so you you're rooted in mindfulness and that sensitivity and then a sort of resourcefulness and awareness of how things are affecting you. And that the the problem with the human mind is this you know, we're, we're always sort of in, in the academic mind, but not just the academic mind. It happens in sport. It happens in, in, in so many different disciplines is that we get sort of hyper-focused on this particular discipline or this particular practice, as it may be. But then we fail to apprehend the need for that sort of holistic view, right? So whether, you know, if if you're really into running, and you're always down the track, you're always putting the, the miles in, you're always running really hard, you'll go out and do 20 miles on a Sunday, whatever, you'll go through hell and back doing the discipline. But then maybe to get better, you need to like think about what you're eating, maybe drink, a, you know, have a few less beers at the weekend or sleep better or like, and I say with meditation as well, it's like, how much value is a breathing exercise if you're anemic because of poor dietary choices? How much value is a breathing exercise if you're not sleeping? Or like, like that you've got to take this, and I think we can get hyper-focused on a particular discipline. And, and actually you touch on it in there, isn't there something about where the goddess has the um, interaction with Mahajanaka when she, she comes to rescue him, where it's like, don't basically the, the sentiment is don't get caught in, so up in something in of itself like you've got to be able to go beyond it even if it's something you know like we think of as with meditation where it's like um in a way it's the path path to salvation you know we it's it's often discussed the fact that at the moment of parinibbana like the final enlightenment and actually in the first enlightenment as well he goes through the jhana practices so then that's taken as an injunction, well, I'll just develop the jhana practices. 
But look at all the other stuff he did, including all these aesthetic practices and so on. Like he he really pushed these different extremes in order to develop true brilliance. And that and if you look at like a great boxer or a great runner or like the greats, they have that holistic perspective. Like the runners aren't just on the track, they're in the gym two or three times a week. You know, it's, it's focused towards a particular discipline, but there is that holistic approach. And I feel like in Buddhism uh, and the way that people approach Buddhism, and then there's these different cults, like the people that are really into fasting or cold water or whatever, that are also exploring these really interesting elements of Dhamma Vichaya. Like there's a guy called Dave Asprey, who's really done a lot of work on fasting, uh, intermittent fasting. He developed the idea of bulletproof coffee and this thing of like skipping breakfast and having this sort of butter coffee thing that help you stay in the fasting state and so on. And he talks about how when he was younger, he he was like really, really obese, like really overweight. And he tried these different practices and he couldn't get it to work. And he went on this like, I wish I could remember more of the details, but he, he went on like a, there was something that was offered, which was sort of like a three day fast in the desert where it's like a shaman with sort of this woman with this healer woman would sort of took him out to this cave and he was just left there for three days just to sort of meditate. And, you know, he's really like quickly within the process, he's talking about craving and all the craving for food and craving for experience and so on and all this. And obviously we've both been on long retreats and so on. Like we know what it's like to be sort of cut off from your normal like day-to-day -day life and the things that you enjoy and so on. But it it struck me there was something that was really powerful about this. And he did, because he didn't refer to, he. I mean, you read a lot of these different pe people's talk and they will talk about how fasting is so fundamental within all these different religious traditions. All the major religions practice fasting in different ways, but he doesn't particularly refer to the idea of Buddhism and that like craving is the root of suffering and so on. But there was something that struck me really deeply about this sort of connection between these these different, I don't want to call them cults, but these sort of communities of people experiencing and experimenting with these different practices and how it sort of struck me that, like with the Buddha, where he, after he leaves, you know, he does these meditation practices, he does this great fasting and he does, you know, he experiences all these different communities of people and sort of learns from them and learns their strengths and weaknesses and so on. Like, I don't know what you mm. say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing with, with fasting or anything like that is you need to be careful you need to be very careful and it, it won't it wouldn't be right for a lot of people mm. and so that's the first thing you need education in it mm -hmm. um the little bit that i've tried i <laughs> i lose too much weight too quickly so it's it's knowing what you know knowing knowing what your limits are is really important mm -hmm. and and importantly understanding what 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 the intentions behind all of it is like if the intentions are um benevolence towards oneself loving kindness towards oneself then 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 you'll approach it in the right way if if the intentions are not if the intentions are are slightly harsh towards yourself then it it will go in a it will go to a negative place I yeah think. although that's part of the learning process because none of us are perfect right mm. so i think it's inevitable like from my experience i've been doing fasting i've gone up to 48 hours was my longest and i've done like I think I've done three or four that were like over 40 hours. So like a whole day of not eating. And I think, yeah, I'm probably slightly biased because I think it's, it has been very beneficial for me, but it's been very difficult. And I've made a lot of mistakes with it as well. And it's funny actually, because one of the main things that I've learned from it is how difficult moderation is compared to extremity. Like it's actually... I'd say from my experience, it's actually easier to fast and just say I'm not eating at all mm. rather than to eat moderately. Mm. Like it's harder. And the the very hardest thing I've found is <laughs> not overeating when you come out of a fast, mm. like gorging, that, that swing of the pendulum. But I would argue that unfortunately 
you need to learn through experience you know you need you need to learn through going through that process it's like with you know with me developing the running training and so on like i've made so many mistakes mm. over the years and i still make mistakes with it i'm still learning it as a craft um but you were because you were really experiencing a lot of cold water stuff I yeah i suppose that's that. that's that's the one where um for me it kind of works um and and definitely found that I was kind of overdoing it a little bit, staying staying in the cold shower a little bit too long, sort of, because you do get this really big kind of endorphin rush afterwards, yeah, um, which is somehow your body kind of saying yes on some level, which is interesting. Um, but I think I was overdoing it a bit. I was in there for sort of five, ten minutes, like every day, and found that my hands were going cold the whole time. So <laughs> clearly, yeah, I have had a touch of that. I have had a touch. But then that, I mean, that is a sign that you've gone too far, right? Because that's your circulation isn't working as well as it should be. Uh, and so I was, and having never had cold hands before in my life, so I sort of scaled it back a little bit. Just do no more than two minutes tops every day, and <laughs> now my hands are warm, and you still enjoy the benefits of of going into the cold so i mean i think that's a case where you know just gently finding what what is the even keel what is the balance you know what what can find the middle way in certain lifestyle choices i suppose it's as well like a sort of you know i'm trying to choose my words quite carefully because I suppose it depends, like, where your starting point is as well. So, like, you know, if I'm trying to think of a good example, if, you know, if you're in a very bad state physically, but some of these sorts of interventions, like maybe cold water or fasting or whatever will help, like, any step in that direction is going to feel extreme in a way. Like, it's going to feel really demanding and painful and challenging. And, that, like, I would argue that, You know, you can only really develop. Like I was thinking about this way, in terms of developing virya or courage. If there's a fire in your house, you want the fire services to be people that have actually dealt with these sorts of situations. They haven't just read it out of a book or whatever. Like they, they actually know fear. They know these sort of challenging environments, and they know what the proportionate response is through experience. And and in order to have had those experiences, they must have taken it to extreme in some way and um yeah and then like preparing for what's coming to all of us like you know the the horror of of life and the the death and suffering of ourselves or of our loved ones that that is will happen at some point it's like how does one how does one prepare for that how does one confront one's mortality and and one's frailty and vulnerability and what I was trying to get at before, but I didn't do a very good job of articulating, is this idea that you know we're 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 completely numb and insensitive to comfort and its sort of ruinous effects on our on our bodies, like overeating or being too warm or not facing any physical challenge and just how damaging that is to us. Um, but we're hypersensitive to threats. So, like you know. If you do a fast, even if you're just missing breakfast or whatever, like, or you're doing a longer fast, like, you know intellectually the fridge is full of food, but your body doesn't. Your body is hardwired to, like, set off the alarm bells and you can really... So you can work with your body's fear of its mortality in a really safe way because at any moment you can just have something to eat, but you set yourself a discipline and you know... You know, and if you are of a more of a scientific mind, you can read into it and you can sort of comfort yourself with these studies that show it's perfectly fine to go however long without food and you're going to ketosis and it might be painful and difficult, but unless you have a really quite severe health condition, it's fine. You're going to be fine, but you can experience the emotional roller coaster as if it's really not. And it's like the cold water thing. You know, your body's so sensitive to that because that's death in the wild you know and um oh like with you know like the, the whole thing of doing running training like if you're doing a hard like a spin class or or doing a, a track session or whatever it might be it's like you can just stop running anytime you're not being chased by a tiger but you're you're triggering 
the sort of neurochemistry, like the circuits in your brain, they're about like overcoming threat and genuine peril. So in a way, we're very fortunate in that like, I'd say to have an experience that's analogous to what the Buddha went through in terms of confronting the frailty and vulnerability of your life and your body, you don't actually have to take it quite to that extreme. But it's still extreme relative to the huge amount of comfort and whatever that we have mm. in the West mm. and in our lives generally. Mm. Yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, there's this interesting passage in, in the Mahajanaka where he reflects on his on his effort. And this is once he's established himself as a king uh, and he reflects on the great effort that he put in to get to that point of kind of prosperity and peace and stability and so on. Uh, and he recalls that effort and, he's, and he, he thinks how good it was and then he experiences PT, he experiences a load of joy in that moment and he gives this kind of inspired speech about the importance of effort. And so it shows this this link between, you know, it's in the kind of the fruits of, of virya, the few fruits of courage are something softer and more delightful, joy. Um, so there's something in that. So <laughs> there's hope on the horizon, as it were. <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like... Yeah, it's just it's just interesting because a lot of these different sort of communities of people practicing in certain ways, whether it's sort of diet communities or, like I say, Dave Asprey and the fasting thing or Wim Hof and the cold water practicing thing, like, you know, it, it strikes me in all the different Buddhist communities and so on. It, it does make me think about um, the Buddha's experience of going around these different communities and really learning from them and learning different aspects and seeing the strengths and weaknesses. Because as we talked about, with any community of people, you know, what defines a community is that they have a shared interest, like a shared goal and shared notions and shared values. And of course, there's strengths and weaknesses to that in that you get a group of people and there will be diversity, of course, amongst a community. There'll always be differing sorry, ideas and people disagreeing and so on. But generally you'll get like a hard core of people within it that are like steering where the group is going and what they see as the real value. And like in that in the Mahajanika, like we said, there's this thing of not getting caught up in anything as an end of itself. Like whether it's I'd I would argue meditation practice like the jhana practice or whether it's like cold water exposure, as you say, or like seeing the value of something, but in a broader spiritual context. Because the problem with a lot of the diet and wellness communities and so on is they become sort of evangelical and dogmatic and they see that their goal is... Oftentimes it's this sort of naive idealism of like wanting to create a sort of perfect physical state where you're in this sort of utopian state of bliss at all times when like you know if whatever you do with the body there is still dukkha within it like there is still suffering within it and that there is the way beyond that but the way beyond that is that dhamma vichaya of like getting your house in order but it's not getting caught up in that as an end of itself it's seeing the courage and and, and having the courage to also fully accept the vulnerability and frailty of the body and the mind mm. and not seeing that as a negative Mm. You see what I mean? Mm. Like, yeah, I mean, I think there's a way to do what we can to minimise our, our suffering, which is a, surely a good thing, um, to then create kind of foundations for for insight and for calming the mind as well. and um, But not, not through any sense that ultimately you can hold on to that state in the body. You know, I mean, if the Buddha teaches anything, it's it's about impermanence, right? So... If there is some some good feeling in the body, or you have kind of fashion for yourself, good health, then that is something to be grateful for, rather than to, to hold on to, right? So that's that's how I see it within within a context of impermanence and the impermanence of human life and so on. It's gratitude that ultimately is the kind of the key thing that should be um, underlying how we relate to to health and so on. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that like there's a like I say, I think there's a there's an urge within certain Buddhist communities to want to sort of jump a step, as I see it, or a few ju- or a few steps in the sort of enlightenment process. In that, it's almost like well, you have mindfulness of body, you do the breathing exercise, 
and then you're straight into like essentially samadhi and like bringing the mind right deep into concentration and then equanimity and I feel like that even minded state is only possible once you've been through that process of 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 developing dhamma vichaya of putting yourself basically becoming the very best possible version of yourself physically and mentally and then the courage that's possible from that state and then actually that you know this this thing about pt i wish i'd looked it up again before we started talking but i've it was a friend of mine who i won't name actually who is a psychiatric nurse and she talked about a specific yogic practice and some other sort of psychotherapeutic practices which are used specifically for treating post-traumatic stress disorder and they involve this sort of shaking and laughing basically and and there's these studies that essentially prove that or evidence that there's a a membrane like a tissue under the skin where we hold on to trauma physically um, and that these practices, and I would argue also like particularly cold water and the shaking that comes out of that and, and some of these other meditation practices are PT, like what's called the one-way practice where we evoke a lot of energization in the body. It's all tapping into this need that in the enlightenment process, you need to develop, you know, you need the mindfulness, the sensitivity, you need the Dhamma Vichaya, the gathering, the getting together, getting yourself into a really good state, sleeping well, eating well, all the basics covered. And then the courage that comes out of that because there's also a learning of vulnerability and sensitivity and so on that happens. And then the PT, to my mind, is essentially a sort of catharsis. It's like purifying the mind of, of the clinging of suffering. And the body. And the yeah. body, exactly, the body and the mind. And then from there but then it needs to be calmed and then it needs to be brought into samadhi the one-pointedness and then there's an even-mindedness where you understand the process i think um so and i think that that's a, the the pt is another thing which has sort of been slightly misunderstood or overlooked like i think it's and, and we see it in the scientific way about this sort of need for catharsis and, and purifying difficult experiences that we've inevitably had I think that's that's important to to consider, and I think that you know the energized states because it's interesting with the fasting states where like combining it with meditation, like it's a really curious thing where it's sort of because you'd expect if you've not really done much fasting or whatever before, you would expect that you'll feel really tired and really lethargic and really weak. And I mean, I've done a lot of experimenting with these different things. And so I I can't comment on coming into it fresh, having not done it at all. It's been quite a while since I first started sort of experimenting with it. But certainly my overall impression of it is that on the one hand, there's certain kinds of concentration that are quite difficult in a way, like decision making, like you can become a bit more in a way a bit more emotional in a certain kind of way but then also like there's certainly you can actually become more energized like I feel I've done some running while fasted and you just feel amazing you so f feel so full of beans so so it's like buzzy and and also I find that you don't really sleep that much mm. especially like if I do a day fast so I eat in the evening and then I have a whole day and then I eat the next day that that night I really don't sleep much and I have wild dreams and stuff and it's actually you're really energized and it is something that I personally have found that in all these years of going on retreats and stuff it's something I sort of regret that I haven't experienced or experimented with more in a retreat context is the sort of sort of altered energized states of consciousness that you experience in fasting i mean like you say you've got to use your common sense and you've got to research there's plenty of you know data online i'm not advocating it for anyone individually i'm just saying for me personally both physically and in terms of that side of things and all the science around like autophagy and purifying the body in that way but also mentally and spiritually i found it tremendously useful and powerful just you know it's and it's important to like get the, that balance between 
like theoretical. So we've talked about the Buddha and his experiences and, and the, from a theoretical perspective, what, what he did and so on, or how it's reported that what he did. But then on the other hand, an experience, you know, how these things sort of affect one individually because, you know, everyone's processes are, are sort of <laughs> non-linear, <laughs> to say the least. So, um, but yeah, like like I say, the coming back to this idea of, of ultimately developing virya or courage. I mean, is there anything else to say more from your like professional expertise on the story, like what what it means to you in terms of other Greek myths and so on? Is it? Um, well, I mean, the thing we've I mentioned Odysseus a few times and it's it's really um, parallels with, with the Odyssey that, that come out most clearly. So a number of the tests that, that the Queen devises um, for these various suitors who will become her husband, which eventually Mahajanaka succeeds in uh, in completing, they they appear in the Odyssey as well. So there's one about finding the head of the bed that appears in the Odyssey. Uh, so does stringing the bow, so a classic case of sort of you know heroic strength, um, which in this case is kind of repurposed as evidence of his virya in some way. Um, but the thing, I mean, the thing that really struck me in rereading it again was how, yes, it's a story about about Viria on the one hand and courage and how you how you develop that and knowing when to let go and to be carried along by a higher power. Um, but really, the whole story, certainly as it's presented, is about exemplifying not the perfection of Viria, but the perfection of renunciation, of letting go of things. And you know, the second half of the story. Well, its final part is is about that where he's he's acquired um, this wonderful life as a king, but then he decides that actually he wants to let it go, and he goes up to the roof of the palace and he just you know he makes this commitment to to live the holy life and give up his earthly possessions and and his family and so on, and he goes up to the roof of the palace and then he he goes through this kind of catalog of things that he has to give up like the beautiful city he says you know when shall i leave matila with its well arranged bazaars or when shall i take the going forth when is the time that that shall be when shall i leave matila splendid with its throngs of horses and so on and so on and he goes through thing after thing after thing which he's clearly attached to and he's clearly longing for still in some way um and it struck me especially in this repeated form when shall i leave when when will that time be that it's kind of wave after wave of sort of attachment is coming to his mind, which he wants to let go of, but we she's still holding on to. And it, it reminded me very much of the scene when he's swimming, where he's literally going through wave after wave and, and developing courage. And so as I see it, the kind of the structure of the story is is one of developing courage, which, you know, brings these fruits of of joy, which he enjoys as a king which then provides a foundation for actually something even bigger, which is a letting go uh, and a letting go of, of attachment and a kind of freedom that, that comes through that. Um, the, the final thing that I actually, one of the things I like most about the story is the way that he sees teachings in ordinary mundane things. So he sees the, the mango tree with fruit is more vulnerable to theft than the mango tree without fruit. So this idea that it's those that have many things, that many possessions are more vulnerable to to them being lost. When you don't have possessions, you don't have craving and attachment, you can't lose in the same way. Uh, or if he sees a, a young girl with two bracelets and they're jangling next to one another, and then on the other wrist she only has one bracelet, which doesn't jangle. There's this idea that, you know, when two things are clashing against one another. So it's just something about the kind of the insight in the everyday, which is kind of wonderful as well. Yeah, and like we talked about, the sort of balance of mundanity and just sort of living in a very pragmatic way, seeing what's happening, being aware of experience and gathering yourself and then how divinity will interject, but only if you've got your house in order first. You can't jump that step. You can't, and, and you said like he enacts the virya in the sea and so on. There's another aspect to it which struck me, which is about honesty uh, and truthfulness and how important it is to the story. So, like I say, there's these two 
acts of great courage and obviously the sea swim is the one that gets emphasized but actually the act of the pregnant mother at the very beginning is a parallel I, I think it's, it's the same thing basically that sort of see but it's the fact that in both cases they see genuine threat there's no pretense there's a genuine catastrophe imminent and they don't panic everyone around them is panicking and freaking out and losing their minds but they react proportionately which is extreme but it's proportionate given the circumstance and that they gather themselves they prepare physically like in both cases like like you say he sort of rubs himself with oil and prepares for the water and takes the food she dresses herself in rags hides her identity so they both prepare their bodies and and they set an intention for where they're going and then having done that they're both saved there there's divine intervention in both cases but only because they've they put their houses into order in a very mundane way but and there's an honesty in in the mindfulness of actually being sensitive to the fact that it's a real genuine uh, calamity that's afoot compared to at the end like you say when he's an ascetic and when he's trying to leave his wife she goes to these huge lengths to stage an attack by an enemy tribe so to the point where these people are like lying prone on the floor as if they've been killed and she's setting fires and setting fire to her own kingdom to try and manipulate him and and he can just see straight through it he knows exactly what's going on and and at the beginning like we talked about where there's the two brothers that have been set at odds with each other again by a deception like someone for some reason decided to lie and say that one brother was after the other brother when that wasn't and he's put up in chains and it's a very common thing in Indian tradition and maybe in Greek as well but this thing of the power of truthfulness especially in the context of dishonesty like how it has a sort of magical power to to just say what's true in the face of lies and deception and the, like again this it's almost like a dam of a chiresque thing of like resourcefulness of or like seeing just clear seeing isn't it and and actually such a truthfulness is one of the 10 parami right of these perfections that he's developing throughout his his life as the bodhisattva is a buddha to be so i just yeah that's another thread to the story which i think is really important mm. quite different to the greek side in that way odysseus is a liar <laughs> through and through and he's he's good at it and he and he's proud of it <laughs> so something quite different there interesting and and um thinking about like you're saying this scene at the end or, or towards the end when he recollect when Mahajanaka recollects his sea swim and this great effort well i think to me it's really important that he like him and the mother like especially with him he's the great being you know he's going to be the buddha eventually but again he knows he's very discerning when it comes to like the circumstances and seeing when he just needs to sort himself out and he can't help the people around him that are dying in the in the in the flood he needs to get himself out and then having done that and it's very much about the like balance between self development and bringing yourself to that point where you're strong and courageous and then you're in the position where you can pass these tests and he's he's essentially invited to become the king like he fulfills the criteria he doesn't just self appoint and as a tyrant right that's a really important point the fact that he's sort of elected in some sense i don't know what you think about mm. that um yeah well, i mean there's a sense in which kind of the stars align for him right um and he doesn't force a situation and i suppose there's well again there's there's something similar in the kind of the great swim scene right where he applies lots of effort and then he's rewarded by some higher power there's something similar in the way that he comes to to the throne and the way that he's found like it's very fortuitous that he happens to be found by people looking for a king right um but he doesn't sort of consciously contrive that because he wants no. to become king yeah he's sort of fulfilling something that's already set up he's not trying to impose himself because that's a really given as a very important principle of, of buddhism isn't it that as a spiritual teacher you like the buddha would teach when he was invited to you know he wouldn't sort of it's trying to curb that evangelical tendency of mind um 
Yeah, I mean, bringing us to the sort of close, thinking about, and again, thinking about this relationship between community and others and individual development, like there is something pretty brutal about the ending. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to lead on in terms how, of... How do you mean? Well, just in terms of, so he's obviously, he's sort of, in some senses, he's already left his wife before he actually physically leaves. Like he goes up and practices in the tower for four months, something like that. And then he sort of decides, I've got to get out of here. I've got to leave altogether. And he shaves his head and she finds that, she realises that he's leaving. And then there's this very, quite long passage where it's a sort of to and fro between them where he keeps, like you say, the mundanity, he's sort of pointing to these different symbols of the need for solitude and 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 in terms of spiritual practice and that uh, i have to find it i'll find the uh the passage the final phrase but it's yeah yeah he keeps like you say there's this thing of the the girl with the bracelets so um i'll just read this passage it's um Little girl, always the darling of your mother, adorned with bracelets. Why does one of your arms make a sound and the other does not? The little girl replied, Ascetic, on this arm are fastened two bangles. From their jangling together the sound arises. This event happens from the second one. Ascetic, on this arm is fastened one bangle. This, without a second, does not produce a sound. It remains silent, a sage. The second is a bringer of dispute. What can a single thing quarrel with? Solitude brings you happiness in your wish for heaven. And he repeats that sort of sentiment a few times and there's this, that same line comes up. Uh, solitude brings you happiness in your wish for heaven. So it's, I mean, it's, yeah, and it ends with, he. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll read the, this last section. They say that although he had asked, do not call me husband, she followed the great being, but could not persuade the king to turn back, and the crowd followed her. Not far away, there was a forest. The great being saw a dark streak of woodland, and wishing to get her to turn back, he broke a reed off from some munja grass he saw on the roadside. Look at this, Severly. This cannot be joined together again, so your association with me cannot be joined together again either. And he said this half verse. Live alone, Severly, like a munja grass reed that has been pulled out. She heard this and cried, From now on there is no more association with King Mahajanaka for me. Unable to bear her grief, she beat her breast and with, with both hands and fell senseless onto the main road. The great being, seeing that she was unconscious, entered into the forest, obliterating his footprints. And so on. And I mean, it. to be fair... So he goes off into the Himalayas to practice. And in the course of seven days, he cultivated the higher knowledges and attainments. And then the queen, she makes these uh, shrines, these significant places. And then she actually ends up taking the going forth. She did the preparations for Kasana practice and attained the meditation destined for rebirth in a Brahma realm. So how do we make sense of that then, mate? <laughs> Well, it seems to end all right. It's, <laughs> what, what, what I take from it is that it's very hard to give up your your attachments, um, and in most of all, your attachments to to your loved ones. Um, yeah, and I don't I don't think it is necessarily advocating that you all have to go forth into the holy life and become celibate. <laughs> and I think there are degrees of attachment, but it's it's I think it's suggesting that there's there's a way to let go, uh, and there may be positive positive benefits positive fruits as a result yeah absolutely and and also that like during the buddha's life there were lay people that attained enlightenment that attained stream entry so it is sort of held up as you know it's it's there's a precedent that it is possible in a lay life today because you know there's been a lot of debate over the years as to whether it's even possible to to practice jhana or practice meditation at all in a lay context you know there's there's a lot of still a lot of debate in the buddhist world about that as a reality but um and it's an interesting thing thinking about the the enlightenment sort of process and the idea that the in terms of the first attainment so just this glimpse of enlightenment so the idea of the 
enlightenment, like the Four Noble Truths, that there is suffering. The suffering is fueled by craving, but there's a cessation of that craving and the process that brings you to that, the, the path, the living the right life. Uh, and that, like, there's this first experience, like a taste of it as a sotapanna. And, you know, like we we're talking about this thing about praying to false gods and so on. That's said to be one of the fetters, as it's called, or like hindrances or like wrong mind states, wrong views that falls away once you've had that first taste of enlightenment is that you know what actually works. Like you, you, so it's interesting that that idea is emphasized here as well, mm. that same principle. Mm. Mm. Well, some something hopeful then to, to leave it on. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Hugo. I really enjoyed Pleasure. today. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's uh, like I say, the we didn't even really talk much at all about the actual performance itself. I think it would be good for me to talk to maybe someone involved in the performance, or or you know, to talk more directly about the the show itself. But I really wanted to get into some of these themes and topics that come out of the story because I feel like they could get a bit lost. You know, there's so much to the performance from a sort of more a super, not superficial, not to be negative, but just a more aesthetic perspective and the combining of Thai and Western music and dance. And like, there's so much in it culturally that's so rich that I, I wanted to give a space to discuss some of these discuss it more from a Buddhist context, but also in, in light of like these other sort of communities as well that I think are related to the notion. And uh, thank you to Mike as well. Are you still there, mate? Are you still awake? I'm still here, yeah. I'm uh, sipping my green tea and listening with uh, intent. Good stuff, mate. Well, um, yeah, and, and thank you to everyone who's listened in and made it this far. Like I say, the full performance video is up there on my YouTube channel as well. And that involves or uh, includes a sort of pre-show talk introduction by Sarah. So Sarah Shaw. So yeah, and, and my website is sebastianreynolds.co.uk and I've got plenty of music available, Spotify, all the usual places. And thanks and big love again to Hugo. Thanks, mate. Thank you, sir. Good love. Bye everyone. Thank you.